to the Snyder Center for, for inviting me. The family and the market are commonly seen as two separate and distinct realms. The family as the realm of love and intimacy, and the market as the realm of self-interested behavior with anonymous others. But in fact, as I hope to show you today, the family and the market are closely and inextricably connected. Over the past three centuries, changes in the capitalist market have repeatedly reshaped the family and continue to do so today. And in turn, changes in the family have created new opportunities for the capitalist market and continue to do so today. The topic of the family and the market is obviously a huge one, and in my talk today, I'm not going to aim at comprehensiveness. That would be futile. What I simply want to do is show you the variety of perspectives from which these issues can be approached. And part of what I want to argue today is that we should be wary of too narrow or economistic a conception of the capitalist market. Thinking about it requires a historical perspective and perspectives drawn from a variety of social scientific disciplines and indeed from philosophy as well. And one 20th century intellectual who functioned on the borderline between economics and the social sciences and philosophy was Friedrich Hayek. And one of his insights that I think is very appropriate for this subject matter is that there is no separate sphere of economic behavior. Hayek insisted that the market didn't only coordinate economic values because he said there's no such thing as economic values. As he put it, and this is a quote, economic considerations are merely those by which we reconcile and adjust our different purposes, none of which in the last resort are economic. So the market, he thought, was about more than self-interest, at least self-interest as the term is often uh, understood and interpreted. Because self-interest, to, to talk about the market just in terms of self-interest, he said, is to suggest that all, mar that all market activity is motivated by selfishness and that only selfish goals require market activity. We, instead, he said, we pursue a wide range of our purposes through the market. If you want to earn money to raise your children, you get that through the market. If you want to earn money to, uh, to build a church to the greater glory of God, you get that money through the market. Uh, if you, so one reason to participate in the market is to get more money to acquire social status. But that's not the only reason, and perhaps not the main reason, why people actually participate in the market. And so it, uh, it's wrong, I think, to think of the family and the market in isolation from one another. And today I want to draw on intellectual history, on social and economic history, on business history, and on contemporary studies of business, and some economics, and some sociology, to try to illuminate this topic from a variety of perspectives. And along the way, I'll mention some authors and books in case you want to follow up some of these themes for yourself. Uh, as Professor Cecilia said, I, I began as an intellectual historian, and I still think that there's a great deal that one can learn from past thinkers, because they often call our attention to aspects of reality that we tend to miss. And that's certainly the case when it comes to the family and the capitalist market. In fact, many of the great thinkers uh, in the modern West have reflected on the issue of the family and the market. And let me give you first a few examples of some of their insights and predictions that are still worth considering, even if we don't buy them wholesale. Let's start with an unusual place. Uh, Hegel, the German philosopher, writing in the 1820s. The family for Hegel was a realm of relations based upon emotional altruism. It's in the family, he said, that we learn to become ethical beings in an immediate emotional form, in relationships between men and women, and in the relations of love and obedience between parents and children. He said, it's the desire to form a family 
that often makes it necessary to acquire a continuous stream of income in the capitalist market. In other words, it's one of the main reasons people actually get involved in working in the capitalist market is in order to support a family. And Hegel points out that family isn't just a subjective condition. It isn't, the state of, it isn't just a state of mind. It has an objective public side. An import, and an important part of that public side is the family's wealth, its family fortune. That fortune is the basis of the survival of its members. So for Hegel, one way in which the love and deep obligation that characterize the family gets expressed is by earning a living in the marketplace. In the and in the search for familial wealth, Hegel says, self-interest and selfishness are transformed into concern for something shared. Well, now let's move ahead by a historical generation to a very different German thinker, namely Karl Marx, writing in the 1840s. Marx wrote a lot about capitalism, of course. Didn't write very much about socialism, interestingly, but he wrote about capitalism. He wrote less about the family, but some of his observations are actually quite prophetic. Uh, when Marx is writing about capitalism in general, he tended to have a gloomy perspective on capitalism in the short term while thinking that the tremendous productivity created by capitalism would ultimately have long-term uh, his, uh, positive historical effects. Uh, and Marx thought that, and Marx stressed the dynamism of capitalism, and he thought that like the means of production, the means of reproduction, the family, were also in the process of transformation. And there too, he thought that the short-term effects were horrendous, but that the long-term prospects were actually encouraging. Capitalism, Marx thought, led to the dissolution of the traditional family as women and children were forced into the workplace. But that, he thought, set the stage for future progress. Here's what he writes. However terrible and disgusting the dissolution of old family ties within the capitalist system may appear, large-scale industry by assigning an important part in socially organized processes of production outside the sphere of the domestic economy to women, young persons, and children does nevertheless create a new economic foundation for a higher form of the family and of relations between the sexes. It's obvious, he writes, that the fact that the collective working group is composed of individuals of both sexes and all ages must, under the appropriate conditions, turn into a source of humane development. So Marx thought that in the long run, the development of the capitalist market would lead to more egalitarian forms of marriage and to workplaces that were more feminized. And there's, been a, lot, there's a lot to both of those predictions. Now let's skip ahead another generation or two to the 1940s, where one of the greatest analysts of capitalism, uh, the Austrian social scientist Joseph Schumpeter, reflected upon issues of the family and the market. Unlike Marx, Schumpeter famously put the enterprising entrepreneur at the center of his explanation of the dynamism of capitalism. But writing in 1942, he thought that that dynamism might come to an end because of changes within the family. Here's, here's, here, here, here was his argument. He said the bourgeois family is disintegrating, and with it, the motive for entrepreneurial behavior. He thought that a major motivation for entrepreneurs to engage themselves in economic innovation was to try to make a fortune that would last for generations. In other words, he thought that a major, major motivation for capitalist entrepreneurs was try, to try to create a transgenerational familial uh, dynasty. But he thought that increasingly people were taking modes of thought that were typical of the marketplace and applying it to familial relations. They were trying to do a kind of rationalistic cost-benefit analysis of whether it was really worthwhile uh, to have children. And he said to uh, many, many parents, he thought, would conclude that the sacrifices entailed in bearing and raising children outweighed the pleasure that they brought. To many potential parents, the relevant questions seem to be, and here's a quote from Schumpeter, why should we stunt our ambitions and, um, and impoverish our lives in order to be insulted and looked down upon in our old age? Unquote. Now, for Schumpeter, this was a case where uh, what seemed to be a rational judgment was actually not rational, because people in making these kinds of calculations didn't actually have enough information at hand. 
he thought that they, many of them would fail to appreciate the real value of becoming a parent, or what he called the contribution made by parenthood to physical and moral health. But for Schumpeter, the decline of this desire for children might mean the end of capitalist entrepreneurialism, because if people didn't aspire to found a, trans a fortune that would last for generations, they might be less creative and innovative, or they might get involved at first, but once they'd made enough to support themselves and their spouses, then they might stop. Well, that prediction turned out to be wrong. It turns out that despite changes in childbearing patterns, uh, entrepreneurialism still goes on. But the tendency to apply cost-benefit analysis to the family uh, has led in many countries to a decline in childbearing and often a radical decline. Well, before we take leave of the stimulating thinkers of the past, let me turn once again to Friedrich Hayek. Because in his books that he published from the uh, 1950s to the 1970s, he took aim at one of the sacred cows of the age, the belief that government should try to bring about equality of opportunity for everyone. In fact, Hayek claimed, there's no substitute for intelligent parents or for an emotionally and culturally nurturing family. And those who didn't come from such a family would be at a disadvantage. And to try to eliminate that disadvantage would mean ever more radical government attempts to control the entire environment in which children were raised. And Hayek pointed out that one of the major motivations for most people to engage in market activity was to provide advantages to their children by providing funds for housing, education, and other opportunities. So to try to equalize the opportunities for children by penalizing those of privileged backgrounds or by rewarding those of disadvantaged backgrounds, Hayek says, removes the most fundamental incentive for people to work and, and exercise their ingenuity in the market, namely the desire to provide advantages for their children. Well, now I want to turn from the realm of ideas to economic and social history to show how the family has both shaped and been reshaped by the capitalist market. It's, it has shaped the market by creating a changing set of demands for new commodities and services. And it's been repeatedly reshaped because of the availability of new commodities and changing means of production that have led family members to deploy their time in new ways. And here are some of the most valuable insights into how the capitalist market and the family have transformed one another comes from the work of Jan de Vries, uh, an historian at the University of California at Berkeley in his book, The Industrious Revolution, Consumer Behavior and the Household Economy, 1650 to the Present, published in 2008. De Vries begins with the economic insight that families have to decide how to expend the time of their members. You can spend your time in paid activity in the marketplace, whether trying to earn wages or profits. You can spend your time doing unpaid labor within the household, or you can spend your time in leisure. But it's a zero-sum game. Time and energy that you put into one of these realms is time taken away from the other realms. And so his book deals with how the allocation of time has changed in the past three centuries and the changing role of men, women, and children. The first modern transformation of the family occurred in Northwestern Europe in the course of the 18th century. And that was linked to what historians now call the commercial revolution of the 18th century, a revolution that preceded the industrial revolution. What happened was that new consumer goods became available that people wanted and that they couldn't make at home or that could be made much more cheaply than they could manufacture them at home. Uh, some of those goods that couldn't be made at home were goods like, like tobacco or tea or coffee or spirits like brandy. All of these, you'll notice, have certain pharmaceutical qualities that make them particularly attractive. And then there were a variety of goods that people used to make in the household uh, with great effort that now, because of changing means of production, the development of 
essentially the division of labor in, man in manufactories, they now became available at much cheaper prices where many more people could afford them. Things like pots, pans, drapery, clothing. So because there were more things that people wanted to buy, they devoted more of their familial time to making money in order to buy those things. Right? They could do so by manufacturing in the household in what was called the uh, cottage industry. That is, you would, you would card or you would weave or whatever in your household. You could do it by engaging in more wage labor. You could do it by engaging in forms of agriculture that were oriented not at subsistence, but selling into the marketplace. So men, women, and children began to spend less time in leisure, less time in doing tasks within the household, and more in trying to, trying to make money because there were more things that were, that were worth buying in it. And because more people were working more of the time, De Vries calls this the industrious revolution. And then that's the first stage of the interaction between the family and the market. Then the next stage comes with the industrial revolution beginning in the late 18th century and stretching uh, well into the 19th century. And that, of course, was characterized by the machine, by the increasing substitution of inorganic forms of power, like the steam engine, for organic sources of power, like human muscles and animal muscles. And in the process of that, human productivity was increased tremendously. And the nature of work was transformed, and with it, the nature of the family. Because now, as opposed to a society based largely on agriculture, or on producing things through cottage industry in the home, production under conditions of the machine increasingly took place in factories. Factories that were built around new engines. Engines that were too loud, too big, and too dirty to have in your home. And as a result, work was increasingly divorced from the household. Things weren't made in the household, they were made somewhere else. And that led to new patterns of familial time use and familial consumption. At first, the owners of these new industrial factories sought out women and children as employees because they were more tractable than men. They were more willing to adjust to the discipline required in the factory. But by the second half of the 19th century, at the latest, uh, the average British working man was enjoying substantial and sustained growth in real wages. And now a new division of labor came about within the family itself along the lines of gender. Men whose relative strength gave them advantages in manufacturing increasingly worked in factories for market wages, which were high enough to support a family. Uh, what the 19th century market couldn't provide were commodities that produced goods like cleanliness, hygiene, nutritious meals, and the supervision of children. Now among the upper classes, those kinds of services could be produced by servants. But for most families, those services were increasingly provided by wives in the household. And so you had the rise of what we might call the the breadwinner homemaker model of the family with a division of labor along gendered lines. The man being the breadwinner, the woman being the, home the homemaker working inside the home. And de Vries has argued that many of the improvements that we think of in the second half of the 19th century, improvements in health, improvements in longevity, uh, came about by the reallocation of female labor from the marketplace into the household. So women were making the houses actually cleaner, the food better, and so on. And of course, the reallocation of the time of children from working in the marketplace to going to school. And that breadwinner home homemaker model of the family continued to be dominant really through at least the 1950s. And then came another transformation of the capitalist market the coming of what Daniel Bell, the American sociologist in a famous book of 1973, called the post-industrial society. And Bell pointed out that in advanced capitalist economies, knowledge, science, and technology were becoming ever more important with changes in the structure of society. And he pointed out that just as 
in the course of the 19th and early 20th century, manufacturing had displaced agriculture as the major source of, of employment. Now, in advanced industrial societies, manufacturing was being displaced by the service center, the service sector. And what was striking was the growing importance of services like education, health, and social services. And he pointed out that in this post-industrial society, one increasingly had a knowledge-based economy. So the production of manufactured goods like automobiles and televisions depended more on technological inputs than on the skill of the workers who actually built the products. And that, he said, would, was already leading and would increasingly lead to a relative decline in the economic value of skilled and semi-skilled workers who worked in factories, and a decline in their numbers too. And just as the United States produced more than enough agricultural products with fewer and fewer farmers, it would produce manufactured goods with fewer and fewer blue-collar workers. That's what Bell predicted. And he also said that in this kind of economy, the sorts of skills that were valued were scientific knowledge, technological knowledge, the ability to work with information, as well as human skills for the social services based on an ability to empathize with others. So physical strength was becoming less important, Bell said, and the ability to connect emotionally with people more so. That's what he predicted in 1973, and that's basically what's happened. The post-industrial knowledge-based service economy created a new balance of rewards that was about to restructure the family. And perhaps the most transformative effect of these changes in the capitalist economy was on the position of women in society. The relative advantage of men lay not wholly, but in good part, in their physical strength, a quality that was becoming ever less important in the economy. Women, by contrast, whether by biological disposition or by socialization, were relatively better at human skills, which were becoming ever more significant in the economy. So the portion of the economy in which women could participate was expanding. Uh, and that meant that their labor, their time, was becoming more valuable. For such women, time spent at labor in the home was now becoming more expensive in terms of their opportunity costs because they could make more in the marketplace. And one result was one result of this was the growing displacement of this male breadwinner, female homemaker uh, model of the household. It was increasingly being displaced on the one hand by dual breadwinner households and by single parent households on the other. Increasingly, women were active in the capitalist economy, not just before they got married and not just before they had children, but even during the years of childbearing and child rearing. Both advocates and critics of the role of women in the paid economy, I think, have tended to over overemphasize the role of the ideological struggles of feminism, and they've tended to underrate the role of changes in the nature of capitalist production in bringing this about. Now this move from the breadwinner homemaker model to one in which both the husband and wife were actively involved in the paid workforce, or to put it another way, the redeployment of female labor from the household to the market created what the historian Jan de Vries has called a second industrious revolution. It was made possible by the existence of new commodities that cut down necessary time to do household work. Commodities like washing machines, dryers, dishwashers, water heaters, vacuum cleaners, and especially actually microwave ovens. The fact that, men and, that both men and women were increasingly working in the marketplace uh, gave rise to new demand for household-oriented consumer goods that required less labor time, like packaged food, or prepared food, uh, or an expansion of restaurant eating, or fast food eating. And it led to what you might call the commodification of care, as the young, the sick, and the infirm were increasingly looked after not by their female relatives, but by paid minders. 
topic to which I'll return shortly. The trend for women to receive more education and greater professional attainments was often accompanied by changing norms in the choice of marriage partners. In the age of the breadwinner homemaker marriage, women tended to place a lot of emphasis on the earning capacity of their potential partners. And men, in turn, valued the homemaking capacity of their potential spouses more than their vocational attainments. So it wasn't unusual for men and women to marry people of roughly the same intelligence, but for women to marry men of higher levels of education and economic achievement. But as the economy passed from an industrial economy to a post-industrial economy based on, as I say, on services and information, men join, uh, women joined men in trying to attain recognition through paid work. And that led to the rise of the industrious couple uh, in which people were more likely to marry their educational and professional peers. It's what sociologists call assortative mating. So instead of the uh, CEO uh, marrying his secretary, uh, now a CEO wants to marry another CEO. Uh, or instead of the doctor marrying his nurse, now a doctor wants to marry uh, another doctor. And that, this process of assortative mating has itself been a source of growing inequality. And here's why. Think about it for a moment. If professional people are marrying one another, that means that their income is double what it would have been a generation earlier. So you have two earner families earning twice as much income. Uh, while further down on the economic ladder, uh, the reverse was happening. For a substantial portion of the households on the lower end of the economic ladder, not only was there no doubling of income, uh, but there, wasn't, there weren't two people, there weren't two adults in the family who were working in the, par in the marketplace. Because as the relative remuneration of women grew, and the relative remuneration of less educated working class men declined, those men were viewed as ever less marriageable. And often some of the limitations of human capital that made those men uh, less employable also made them less desirable as companions as well. So with less to bring to the table, such men were regarded as less necessary, as more women ca calculated that the costs of living with them outweighed the benefits. So women could count on earning capacity of their own and on provisions of the welfare state that left them with an additional source of income, however meager. So in the United States, among the most striking developments of recent decades has been the stratification of marriage patterns along class lines. To understand what's happening among the top 20% of uh, women in American society, the best book that I know of is by an English economist, Alison Wolfe, uh, in her book, The XX Factor, How the Rise of Working Women Has Created a Far Less Equal World. It's a book that hasn't gotten nearly enough, nearly the attention that it deserves in the United States. It's a very wide-ranging work. It's a work, as far as I can tell, completely devoid of political ideology, uh, and it's, uh, it's full of insights. And to understand what's going on in the bottom 25 to 30 percent of the population, the best guide that I know of is another book that hasn't gotten the attention it deserves, a book by uh, an American public policy analyst uh, at Brookings Institution, Isabel Sawhill, a book called Generation Unbound, subtitled Drifting into Sex and Parenthood Without Marriage. One of the key points that Alison Wolf makes, but sh she's not the only one to have made this point, is that current patterns tend to intensify the relationship between family background and educational and economic achievement. You might think that with the rise of dual earner families, in which both husbands and wives are engaged in market-oriented labor, you might think that they would invest less of their time in raising and nurturing their children. But it turns out that the time spent in raising and nurturing children also varies by class. Uh, and that people who are on the more educated and more successful part of the, 
of the social spectrum have actually been spending more time in educated, educationally oriented activities with their children. And not only women, but men too have been spending more time. According to some studies, the time devoted by educated men to child rearing activities in the United States has doubled since the 1960s. And in the United Kingdom, it's almost tripled. And so these families have a lot of advantages in terms of what you might call human capital, that is, in developing mental and emotional characteristics that are conducive to educational and economic achievement. And some of those advantages have to do with the interaction of children with the market. One of the things that uh, these families that are more educated or stronger in human capital do is that they tend to monitor more carefully how their children interact with the market. And that's important because the market produces all kinds of goods and services and some of those are useful for people and some of them are not useful, especially if you engage in too much of them. Uh, and so the, the trick for families is to make use of the cultural opportunities that the market makes possible while avoiding some of the snares of watching too much TV or spending too much time on video games or wanting to have uh, you know, the most expensive set of sneakers or, or whatever. And that brings us to another relationship between the family and the market, and that is the extent to which families protect their members, especially their younger members, against the lures of the market. As critics of the market, from uh, Herbert Marcuse to Pope John Paul II have noted, the market does a lot of things, and one of the things that it does is it includes people trying to sell you things that you don't really need, that may not be good for you, and the acquiring of which might lead you to sacrifice a good deal of your time, your creativity, and your human relations. So one of the most important things that a family can teach is the need to say, no, I don't really need that. And in that sense, the family provides not only a complement to the market, but when it's most successful, it provides a kind of counterweight to some of the potentially negative influences of the market. Well, now I want to offer you another perspective on the relationship between the family and the world of business, and that is the issue of family businesses. Uh, so far, I've been talking mostly about people in their role as employees. But what about in their role as entrepreneurs and owners of businesses? So another link between the family and the market is the phenomenon of family firms. Uh, my impression is that family firms don't get much attention in business schools, which are more likely to focus either on startups or on publicly owned corporations. But in fact, family owned firms have historically been central to the development of capitalism, a subject that's been explored by historians like David Landis, uh, the late David Landis, or my colleague at Princeton, Harold James, uh, and by Leonora Davidoff and Catherine Hall in their book, Family Fortunes, Men and Women of the English Middle Class, 1780 to 1850. Even today, family firms play a far more important role than most people imagine. More than three quarters of registered companies in the industrialized world are family businesses. In the United States, about 20% of the companies on the Standard & Poor Index are family controlled. That is to say, one-fifth of the biggest companies uh, in America. And once you get below the level of the biggest companies to medium-sized firms and to smaller firms, the percentage that are family-owned is, of course, much higher. And it's not only an American phenomenon. The importance of family business is even greater in one of the most successful Western economies, that is to say, in Germany. And when you look beyond uh, Europe and the United States to places like India and South Korea, and China. Family firms are even more important uh, in those countries. Family firms have a number of obvious disadvantages, which explains why they're not the most prevalent form of uh, capitalism. The mixing of business and blood can be toxic because you can have rivalries, because rivalries between siblings can turn into disputes over business decisions. 
while disputes over business can poison family relations. Not only that, but there are often succession issues. Which of the children or children-in-law or cousins should take over primary responsibility for the business once the founding generation has left the scene? And of course, getting the founding generation to leave the scene is often a problem in and of itself. And even if the line of succession is clear, there's still the problem of the quality of management, since, since it's by no means obvious that the members of the family will be better managers of the firm than would be a hired non-relative. That's why many of the most successful transgenerational businesses are family-owned, but not family-managed. But family-owned businesses also have advantages that are often overlooked. They, for one thing, they provide a solution to what's some co sometimes called the principal-agent problem. That is, how can the owners of a firm, the principals, ensure that those who manage it, the agents, manage in the interest of the owners and not just of the managers themselves? Well, one solution for that is the owners to actually control the firm so that they're both the principals and the agents. They don't have to be the CEOs. Uh, they only need to be well represented on the board of directors. In fact, one could argue that family-owned firms offer a partial solution to one of the greatest problems in the contemporary American economy, the problem of short-termism. That occurs when the management of a company is motivated by economic incentives to engage in actions that will boost the stock price in the short term by boosting profits, uh, and by do, but when they do so by cutting back on expenses in a way that will harm the company in the long term. If it leads companies to underinvest in research, also in their physical capital, also in their human capital, that is in development of their employees, which are all sources of long-term economic growth. Executives who engage in this kind of short-termism do so in good part because the structure of incentives is such that their jobs depend on it. They're under pressure from investors, uh, from, uh, from uh, institutional investors, to maintain or improve their stock prices uh, every quarter. And if not, the shares will be sold and the, invest and the managers may lose their jobs. The advantage of family-owned firms is that they have a more long-term commitment to the well-being of the family, uh, to the, sorry, to the well-being of the company that they own. And so they may be more willing to tolerate short-term losses in the interests of long-term gains, a structure of incentives that's more conducive to economic growth. And perhaps for that reason, Family-owned firms, especially when the name of the firm, uh, when the name of the firm is the name of the family that owns it, tend to have greater public trust. Or to put it another way, family ownership turns out to be one of the more effective forms of branding. So think about companies like Mars Candy, which doesn't have to do with the planet; it has to do with the Mars family, which has owned it for many generations. Or a firm like Helena Rubinstein. Indeed, in recent decades, old family firms, uh, where the families were often uh, rather anonymous and in the background, have taken to constructing a public narrative of the history of their companies as a way of increasing that sense of public trust. Now, let me examine the relationship between the family and the market from one last perspective. And that is the way the dynamic relationship between the family and the market creates new demands and new opportunities, both in the workplace and in the marketplace. The growing presence of these two earner families, together with other changes in the structure of families, like the rise of single parent families, have created new sources of stress and tension, but also new sources of economic opportunity for enterprising companies and enterprising individuals. As more women work full-time, there's less time available for tasks of caring for the young, the infirm, and the aged. And that has led to new frontiers in the commodification of caring, that is, in paying others from outside the family to do some of the tasks previously performed without remuneration within the family. Companies, at least those with sufficient resources, 
have responded by offering an array of caring services to their employees. Indeed, one way in which companies and institutions like universities have responded to the tension created by the two earner family is by the creation of a whole new branch of human resources known as work-life balance centers. They try to help provide daycare, uh, adoption support, uh, as well as elder care, most of which are outsourced by these companies to specialized providers. And these companies are doing so for eminently economic reasons. They do so to attract and retain employees, and they do so because they want to get the most out of their workers on the job. And that means they want workers while they're on the job to be able to focus their mental attention on the job rather than worrying about a sick child at home or an ailing parent. That is to say, companies are motivated to engage in these new caring services by the desire to maximize employee productivity. And new providers of such services have sprung up across the country. And new companies that provide clearinghouse websites where potential providers of these services can match up with potential clients. One such company has the revealing name of care.com. Uh, I'm not a shill for them, but if you take a look at their website, you'll see what I mean about the proliferation of these caring services uh, that are now available. So you see the dynamic process. Changes in the capitalist market create new and more remunerative forms of work for women while offering more goods that families want to buy. So women engage in more full-time work through a higher percentage of their life course. And with both adults in the family working or in single parent households where the only parent is working, there's a shortage of time left for intrafamilial tasks from food preparation to caring for children and the elderly. So people buy more prepare food or food that requires less preparation time together with devices to cut down on preparation time all the way from microwave ovens to coffee that comes in little capsules. There's also, as I've indicated, a new demand for the paid caring professions. And that, in turn, creates new jobs for other men and women. Well, I haven't exhausted the ways in which one can look at relationships between the family and the market, but I'm coming close to exhausting my time, especially because I want to leave some time uh, for questions. I hope you've seen why people in business need to think about the family and think about the family not as a, just as a static institution, but as a changing dynamic one. For businesses, that has implications for the products and services they offer and for the ways in which they hire and retain employees. Those, these are issues that actually everyone needs to think about who uh, aspires, to, who either has a family or who aspires to form a family. How can you make use of what the market has to offer to forge the sort of family that you'd like to have? How important to you are monetary wages, as opposed to, say, flexibility of hours and other child-oriented benefits? So whether you're thinking about yourself, your company, or society as a whole, it's important to reflect on the family and the market, those two deeply interconnected realms. Thank you. Thank you.